Welcome to Nobilis Erotica, episode 324. I am your host, Nobilis Reed. If you haven't already figured it out, this podcast has dirty words in it. So if you don't want to hear people say words like cock or fuck or pussy, then you should listen to something else. This episode of Nobilis Erotica is sponsored by Circlet Press, the world's leading publisher of erotic science fiction and fantasy since 1992. Celebrate the erotic imagination with them at circlet.com. Our story this week from author A.C. Wise is All the Spaces in Between. A.C. Wise is the author of numerous short stories appearing in publications such as Clark's World, Lightspeed, The Best Horror of the Year, Volume 4, and the erotica anthologies What Lies Beneath and Geek Love. In addition to her fiction, she co-edits Unlikely Story. You can find her online at acwise.net. This story appears in the anthology The Flesh Made Word, edited by Bernie Moises. Available now from Circlet Press. It's read by me, with help from Veronica Jaguer and Wilson Fowley. So, let's not wait any longer. Here's the story. All the Spaces in Between by A.C. Wise The typewriter came to Leon in the way all typewriters did, which is to say, of its own volition, and in a way unlike any other. But exactly like the others, every other stretching as far back as he could remember, it touched him first in dreams, reaching for him, and pulling him into wakefulness. Leon woke to a shaft of pale light lying across the too large bed. The sound from his dream remained, a soft tap something like rain, but much more like the strike of keys. The taste of ink and a hint of metal coated his tongue. The room smelled of smoke, though he hadn't burned so much as a candle in years. His bones creaked as he rose, and his skin ached around them. Leon crept down the stairs. Typewriters flocked to him like strange birds, crowded every shelf and covered every available surface in his too small shop. Gray light seeped through the windows and lay heavy atop the sorrow permeating the room. A glance, flicker quick, took in each machine, everything in its right place. In silence, Leon greeted each by name, by the scent and flavor of their dreams. Here, one tasted of mud and water. It had called to him out of sleep with a siren song so terrible and wild he'd waded into the river to save it from drowning. There... One smelled of dry earth and vegetation just on the edge of rot. He had found it in a cornfield, watched over by a scarecrow, with a black feather stuck between its keys. Too many had come carried under the arms of desperate-looking people, selling what they could before fleeing the city for good. Those dreams were all panic-gnawed and tasted of salt tears. Typewriters were a luxury. Books were only what you burned when you ran out of other fuel, nothing more but Leon was glad to trade for a few coins vanished into his neighbor's hands. If those coins would buy peace as they fled, then they were better in those hands than his, and the typewriters were safer with him. After all, where was there to run? The city emptied, and Leon stayed in his narrow shop, half of it shut up and dark now. It leaned against an abandoned jeweler's store. Who would pause to admire pretty stones when the streets glimmered with shattered glass and ruby blood? Leon shuffled across the bare wooden floor and opened the door. The typewriter huddled on his doorstep, a broken-winged bird, so full of wanting and so desperate to be loved. Oh, you poor thing! Leon bent, gathering it into his arms. His back twinged, but he ignored it. Clearing a space on the same workbench that had brought the drowned typewriter and countless others back to life, he set it down. He switched on a lamp and warm light pooled yellow between the keys. Even though it had faded, the paint flaking slightly at the edges, the gold letters in the black casing still shone in the lamplight. The keys were no longer the bright white they once would have been, carrying the memory of fingertips, but they were whole and undamaged, the letters still visible, the silver ringing each key barely tarnished. Aren't you a beauty? A smile lifted the corner of Leon's mouth. May I? a foolish old man talking to ghosts. If anyone had been here to see him, Leon shook his head, allowing the thought no further. 
A frown replaced the smile. When he'd pulled the typewriter from the river, he'd coughed cold water laced with mud for weeks. With the typewriter from the field, poetry written by crows had scrolled across his lids every time he closed his eyes. He'd nearly gone mad with that one, only barely stopping shaking hands from letting all his dark feather blood out with a razor and running it down the drain to make the words stop. What would this typewriter bring him? He laid a finger on the space bar. His breath caught sharp, and when he let it out, it trembled. Sunlight laced the breath, filtered through with dust. It came with the faintest hint of sweat pooled at the base of a spine, fingers resting on keys, barely touching, head bent, hair trailing against the nape of a neck, lips parted slightly, absorption, concentration, loss of the best and worst kind, a pulse racing. And, oh, one more time. Leon drew back. He hadn't felt anything like that since, oh, it had been a very long time. He rubbed his hands over his face, covering his eyes for a moment until his breath steadied. The typewriter crouched, reproachful as a cat. He'd taken it in, he'd owed it care. After all, were it a cat with a broken leg, would he turn it out? Leave it to hunger in the rain? And the typewriter was hurting. Otherwise, why come to him? Why risk the dangers of the city if not for a knot of pain lodged deep beneath the memory of desire still dusting the keys? Oh, very well. Leon squared his shoulders, ignoring the ache. But a deep breath drew ghosts into his lungs, leaving his chest aching. He glanced at the curtain dividing the closed-up half of the shop from his workspace, and somehow he'd crossed the room, hand resting heavy on the fabric, fingering the worn velvet before drawing it aside. Bolts of cloth leaned against the walls. A dress form haunted one corner. On the table, a suit half-made, the bits all dusty but laid out and still gleaming with pins, waited for hands that would never come to stitch them together. Leon let out a breath. Lifting his chin, he crossed to the small cabinet besides the dress form and turned the key. Not as secret as you thought, he murmured. He wanted to smile, but the words lodged something sharp in the space below his breastbone. His knees popped as he straightened. An inch of liquid remained in the bottle. It had never been to his taste, but... For courage! He uncorked the bottle and drank it straight from the neck, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. It burned his throat, his eyes stung, or he told himself it was the alcohol and not the memory of a tongue carrying those same tastes of smoke and peat and just a hint of honey. Leon set the bottle down too hard. The needles and bobbins and spools of thread on the long, unused work table jumped. Get a hold of yourself! Leon held his hands out, glaring at his long fingers until they stopped shaking. Where would the world be if every surgeon operating on a child thought of her son until her hands trembled so badly she couldn't perform the simplest procedure? Typewriters found him to satisfy their own needs, not his. Let's have a look, then, shall we? The curtain fell into place, sealing away the ghosts occupying the other side of the room. Leon tested each key, pressing just hard enough to make sure each type bar rose and fell as it should. He ignored the echoes of fingertips on the keys. Thoughts like that were for the young, for the spry, for those without broken hearts. Ah! He spotted the problem as he peered into the inner workings. The ribbon had snagged, bunched against the spool meant to gather up the used band of ink-soaked cloth. Leon touched the taut fabric. A shiver ran down his spine, exactly as if someone had whispered in his ear or dragged a finger over his skin. His flesh puckered, his hair standing on end. He worked the two reels free, lifting them from the body of the typewriter. The fabric slackened, the tension released, but the ribbon still hummed. No longer stretched taut, the tension was of a different kind. It made Leon think of storms waiting to break, of lightning tucked within clouds, of rain aching to fall. His cheeks warmed, his bent fingers shook. Bringing the fabric within inches of his eyes, Leon took a deep breath. Did he really want to see? Letters shimmered against the ink-dark cloth, just barely visible. 
each keystroke imprinted like a ghost. And behind the ghost words, the woman who had written them sat at her attic desk. A shaft of sunlight touched the back of her neck, catching in the fine hairs brushing her skin. Her fingers, work-worn, paused to rub a stiff muscle in her shoulder. Her nails were short, crescents of black ink caught beneath them. Like the river mud and the poetry of crows, the woman's life slammed into him, a storm shattering Leon's bones, unmaking and remaking him in the space of a single breath. Her life opened to him like a book, pages blurring fast until one sliced deep. Leon hissed, resisting the urge to put his finger in his mouth and suck away imaginary blood. The woman stood in front of a linotype machine. Thinking herself alone, she ran a hand over the keyboard. At a sound behind her, she whirled. Caught breath became a smile. Her startled heartbeat sped to a different rhythm. How did I know I'd find you here? Well, I do work here. She cocked a hip, raising one eyebrow. Yes, and the workday is long over. The woman merely shrugged. Sweat prickled at the base of Leon's spine, an echo waking in him at the borrowed memories. The smell of ink, of machinery cooling as the day wound down, the pulpy tang of paper. He breathed through his mouth so as not to drown in the smells. The man moved closer, cupping the woman's face. She leaned into the touch, and he drew a thumb along the curve of her cheekbone. They moved at the same instant, closing the last space between them. Her back struck the press. Even his mouth tasted of ink. He lifted her. She hooked a leg around him, keeping him close. He dampened his lips with sweat from the arch of her throat. One hand undid the first few buttons of her dress. The other bunched her skirt around her thighs. Her short nails raked his back, stopping short of drawing blood. Hasty, tearing cloth, he slid a finger into the slick wetness between her legs while circling her clit with his thumb. Her breath snagged, her nails dug deeper, leaving crescents, red parentheses, in his skin. She crushed her mouth against his, bruising hard. Desperation filled the kiss. Behind the desire, behind the taste of ink, there was salt. Not sweat, but tears. She freed his cock. Her nails cut deeper still into his back as she guided him inside her. More than pleasure, her mouth chased silence as it pressed to his. There were words she didn't want to hear, words he didn't want to say. So they fucked instead, amid the memory of drying ink and the slugs melted back to molten form, as if the melting could erase the meaning of the headlines they printed, speaking of war. Anger or fear made her draw blood, dragging four perfect scratches down his back as she came. She leaned her head against his chest. Tell me. She kept his cock inside her and her fingers traced circles in the sweat-matted hair in his chest. Just tell me. His hands shook as he retrieved a folded piece of paper from the pocket of the trousers, undone and hanging loose around his waist. The draft lottery. He handed her the paper. I'm going to the front. She took the paper, holding it for a moment before crushing. Without a word, she unwound her legs from his body, sliding his cock out of her. She stood, smoothed her skirt, and turned away. He touched her shoulder. We'll write every day. And no matter what, we still have words, and they can't take those away from us. Besides, he turned her and placed his hand against her cheek again. There's still time before I leave. Two weeks. All the time in the world. Shuddering, Leon lowered the ribbon. All that in a glance. All that before he'd even read the words traced in the ink. If her ghost... His ghost was that strong. His head ached, unshed tears pressing against his eyes. His body was hot and hollow, drained as though he'd been inside the skin of the man and woman fucking so desperately in the quiet twilight shadows of a newspaper office. How long ago? Back at the beginning of the war, before it had reached the city, spilling over from far away to drown the streets of home. A lifetime ago. He clenched his fingers into fists, trying to still the shaking. He should sweep the damn typewriter and all his tools onto the floor. Let the casing shatter. Let the keys crack. He wanted... He let out a breath. He wanted impossible things. Time couldn't spool back like the ribbon, wound from one cartridge to the next. History wouldn't change its course no matter how much he raged, no matter how much he screamed. Not for all the blood that had been shed, not for all the lives lost, just for one. 
It was a small, selfish thing, but he couldn't stop himself from wanting it just the same. Leon set the ribbon down and stepped away. Damn, but why wasn't there any more liquor in that stupid cabinet? Leon had never wanted it before, and now... Now he wanted to drink until his body was as sick and hot and empty as his soul. He made himself go back to the work table after allowing himself to avoid it for two days. The typewriter sat in silent judgment, watching Leon every time he passed. Its need permeated the workshop, seeping up the stairs to infect the apartment. Leon couldn't sleep. He paced, restless, and the ghosts beneath the typewriter keys tangled around the roller and soaked into the long, dried ink of the ribbon, chased at his heels. The typewriter needed to be exorcised, the woman's memory exhumed. There was no time, no space for his self-pity, as though he was the only one in the world to suffer loss. Leon chose his most delicate tweezers. Careful, lest ribbon tear or the words vanish and the ghosts haunt him forever. Patient, breathing in and out, he freed the tangle of ribbon and unwound the whole thing. His hands shook with exhilaration, the length of ribbon stretched between them. The unused bit wasn't very long. She'd almost been at the end of the spool. And if it hadn't jammed, would she have thrown it out and even the memory of her words been lost? Leon ran the ribbon between his fingers, words thrumming against his skin. Oh! The sound slipped from him once more. Or was it the echo of an indrawn breath in an attic room long ago? Like a static charge, the imprint left in the ribbon shot through him, sinking through flesh and blood and going deep into his bones. Reach you in whatever hellhole you're in. Her fierceness's army is here, too. In the streets, her metal soldiers clanking up and down at every hour. The air reeks of coal and smoke and worse things, too. They told us if we went to war, it would never come to us. Do you remember? Bile stung raw at the back of Leon's throat. Was it his or hers? Her chapped, ink-stained hands rubbed her neck where her hair trailed in the sunlight. Leon's muscles tightened in sympathy, her weariness becoming his. But beneath her pain, desire still stirred. Somehow she'd found a way to make space for both sensations inside her skin. Wanting rose up in her, memory overwhelming the present. She had learned the secret of winding back time, pulling her lover into her arms, even though he was a world away. Leon's breath snagged his fingertips drawing words from the inky ribbon again. So, there is war here, and war there. But violence isn't the bridge between us. It will be as we promised. We'll write our way to some happy medium, a middle ground without the sound of breaking glass or the stench of burning flesh. We know blood can be sweet, too. And scars precious. Leon's breath quickened, and with it, the pulse of blood in his old veins. The edge of the woman's sleeve rode up as she massaged her neck, affording a glimpse of faint scars circling her wrist. Do you remember the first time I cut you? Your heart beat so hard as I turned you away from me. Was it desire or fear? Or both. But you trusted me. And I was kind, wasn't I? I wrote just one word on your shoulder, breaking the skin with my sharp nib. You gasped, and you shivered too. I'd stripped you in front of the fire, and the heat of your skin soaked through my clothes. But even in all that warmth, your skin prickled tight around every hair. After the blood came ink. I dipped my pen, mixing both, and wrote a circle around the word carved in your flesh, a small tale of your body and mine. I rested my other hand on your hip as I wrote, feeling the tension shift through your muscles, from flight to desire, 
in a series of tremors, rocking you to your core. Can I tell you now, after all this time, how much effort it took to keep my hand steady on the pen? You thought I was the brave one, unafraid, and guiding you. Do you know how desire nearly broke me? All my will was there, on steadying the words. Only when the circle was closed, ink sealing blood, did I let out my breath. When I kissed the back of your neck, it tasted of smoke from the fire. While your blood and my ink ran on your skin, I slid my hand around your hip. How much heat was your own? And how much the fire? I trailed my lips over your skin, touching every place on your back except your shoulder. When I finally touched your cock, you were so hard. Every touch on your skin I felt on my own. When you came in my hand, I dug my teeth into your shoulder to keep from screaming. Is... There a scar there, too? I was shaking when you turned around. Do you remember? My skin prickled, too, shivering and pulled tight the way yours had and sheened with sweat. You took my hand, slick with your cum, and kissed it. And then you kissed me and the taste of you erased the smoke. Leon's breath hitched. He drew his fingers back from the ribbon, half expecting blood, as though something sharp in the fabric had cut his skin. But there was nothing. He traced his fingers over the ghosted letters again, trembling. When it was my turn, you retrieved your own pen. Polished shell, inlaid in dark wood, the length of it gleamed with light borrowed from the flames. The nib, with its delicate etchings, reminded me of the whorls and the ridges of fingerprints. As desire nested inside fear before, fear curled inside the woman's desire now. Unease sped her pulse. As it had been when Leon experienced them fucking against the linotype machine, there was something frantic in her typing. She rushed through the words, the clacking of keys designed to drown out some other sound. My knees shook. I could barely stand. All the times we were together. In the office. After everyone else was gone. In the library. Stolen moments. Endless nights. But this was different. Why else were we so afraid? Your fingers shook as you unbuttoned my dress. I'll never know how I managed to stay upright. You held your pen between your teeth, placed your hands on my shoulders. You turned me to face the fire as I turned you. Fabric pushed over my shoulders, past my hips, your lips next to my ear. You whispered for me to lie down. There was no blood. Not until the end. I think you were still a little afraid of me. Or for me. Or maybe you just wanted to make it last. The woman flinched, her fingers still on the keys for a moment. Leon gripped the ribbon hard, his bones aching, but he couldn't let it go. He had to read until the end. You started with my shoulder, where I began with you. At the first touch of the nib on my skin, wet with ink, I bit my lip to keep from screaming again. I knew the word from the way the metal moved, so teasing light, the loops and curves of the letters tracing over my flesh. Not a beginning, but the continuation of my words. We are writing the story even now. 
Sitting in my attic room, you miles away in the mud, breathing gunpowder air. We're still only inches apart. Your pen is at my shoulder, tracing down my back. Even now, you've run out of space. You're rolling me over. Your nib traces my lips, circles my throat. My body is dense with ink. I was kind with you, but you were cruel, exactly as I wanted you to be. You drew it out, until there was scarcely any space left for all the words you'd written. I remember the word that made me come. The pen jagged sharp on the last stroke. Your breath caught. Blood welled. The nib drove deep, obscuring the word, pushing it inside me, writing it on my bones. That time, I did nothing to stifle my cry. Her fingers fast, a blur. Were there tears in her eyes? Then, and only then, did we fuck with our bodies instead of our words. You slid your finger between my lips, and I sucked the taste of ink from your skin. Your other hand slid between my legs, stroking my clit. You put one finger inside me, then two, as if you were saying you were sorry for hurting me. But I wasn't sorry at all. We smeared all that ink and blood between us. Your words, my words, written on both our skins. The story of us, indistinguishable by the time we finally slept, well after dawn. Do you remember? Leon's fingers reached the end of the ribbon, sudden as an electric shock. The words stopped where the typewriter jammed, the fabric torn slightly, where it had caught in the mechanism. Gray light from the drizzling world beyond the windows seeped through the pinprick hole. He lowered trembling hands, breath rough, pulse tripping. No wonder the ribbon had jammed. He'd seen her fingers, flying panic-swift over the well-loved keys, the clack of letters pounding to the rhythm of her blood, pounding against the sound of splintering wood and metal-shod feet on the stairs. He let go without meaning to. The ribbon fluttered to the ground. Oh! Oh, no! His eyes flew open, and he bent, ignoring popping bones to gather the ink-soaked cloth. It tangled around his fingers, cutting off his circulation. He didn't want to see beyond the moment the ribbon jammed. When the door splintered, did she turn? No, she kept her fingers on the keys until the last, until the ribbon snagged. And then... He wouldn't look between the keys... If she died in the attic room, he didn't want to know. He had to believe time had stopped in the moment before her death. He had to believe the bridge of words stretched between her and her lover had snatched her up, whisked her away, set them both free. I'll find you. Rain tapped the windows and the roof. Leon stroked the typewriter keys, chasing the ghost of the woman's fingers. The typewriter had a mate somewhere. He could see it. Shell green, small, portable, spattered with mud. The attic woman's lover had lugged it into the hell of war, forsaking rations, maybe, extra clothing just to write to her. I'll find you, he said again, his voice stronger this time. There were few things Leon knew with certainty. He did not know why tyrants fought, or why their wars were so hungry they could only be fed by consuming the person you loved most in all the world— he didn't know a good many things, how quick fingers could sew any tear with infinite ease, how to choose the best bottle of wine to go with each meal, the names of all the great composers, or how to mend a broken heart. But he knew typewriters. He knew them in his soul, and he would find the one that had gone to war and come back battle-scarred. Perhaps it was too late for him, but not for these two. He would find the words buried at the heart of the soldier's typewriter and bind them to the words left by the attic woman, making the bridge, making two halves whole. Leon 
Leon breathed out. Side by side, the two typewriters hummed with memory. The space between them crackled, a storm ready to break. They glowed. The second typewriter was exactly as he'd pictured it. Where the first was elegant, black with faded gold script, keys round and sleek, the second was functional. It was a soldier's typewriter, small and cramped. Its shell was army drab green, its keys blocky and off-white. Its casing was indeed scarred, and the memory of mud and other filth still marked its sides. He'd found it among the wares of a man selling goods from the back of a wide barge tied to one of the disused piers along the riverbank. As if wakened by Leon's discovery of the attic woman's typewriter, it had called to him. He'd followed the scent of gunpowder and torn hot metal from his dreams. Bent spoons, dented tin cups, uniforms riddled with holes where the insignia had been torn free, helmets riddled with holes for other reasons. Among all the fragments of lost lives the man had vultures scavenged from the dying and dead, there sat the typewriter. When he touched it, Leon felt its journey, stowed in the printer-turned-soldier's pack, carried from camp to camp. He felt paper once rolled around its cabbage rain-damp and disintegrating between his fingers. The bone-numbing cold, the smell of gunpowder, and the sound of tanks rolling endlessly across the ruined land— they filled Leon until his throat nearly closed and tears stood out in his eyes. He'd paid the bargeman what he'd asked and hadn't even tried to bargain. His hand still shook as he laid his fingers gently on the keys. They were grubby, the color of old bones, the letters near worn off in some places. A tremor passed through his body, electric and chill. The hair on the back of his neck stood on end, and at the same time his bones unknotted. The ache he'd known since, since. Ben! He mouthed the name. It clotted his tongue, tasting of lead. How long it had it been? His breath wheezed. The soldier's calloused hands, the woman's ink-stained fingers, they were nothing like Ben's needle-pricked fingertips. Yet his blood sped. Leon moved one hand to the first typewriter. Oh! He closed his eyes, groaning aloud. His body responded, his cock stirring in a way it hadn't in years. He drew his hands back, the erection fading already, and opened his eyes. It was an easy thing to lift the cartridge free from his second typewriter and unwind the ribbon. He tilted it into the light. The ghost of words shimmered, just as they had on the attic woman's ribbon. They played tricks, sliding in and out of his vision, as if needing to be touched to be real. He ran a finger along the fabric's length, static electricity building beneath his skin. The soldier's uniform was stained with blood not his own, filthy with mud, torn. His cheeks, hollow, still flushed. Rain-chilled fingers flew over the keys. Trenches. But that isn't what I want to say. I don't want to talk about this place. I want to talk about home, and you are my home. Is the fire still burning? That's where I picture you, standing in front of the fireplace, your pen in your hand. Ben's fingers holding a length of thread, Ben's teeth clamped around a needle, Ben's eyes half-closed in concentration. Leon breathed in, breathed out, ran his fingers over the ribbon, and drank in ghosts other than his own. It's hard to find even a moment's privacy here, but when I do, I touch my scars. I touch them because I know you are touching yours. Is it mad that I can feel you even here, even now? There's mud all around me. Shells explode. Some of the other soldiers can't remember anything but rain. But when I close my eyes, I smell lines of hot metal type. I smell smoke from burning logs and I taste ink on my tongue. When I have a moment alone, any time I have a moment alone, I undo this damned uniform and run my hands over my skin. The scars under my fingertips are electric. That's how I know you're touching yourself, too. It's like lightning, isn't it? The ridges of flesh respond to the faintest touch. Sometimes it takes everything I have not to make a sound, more than once, I admit, I've come with a single touch. I'd be embarrassed if I didn't think you'd understand. 
but you know. You know what the scars are. They are a bridge between us. They are hungry mouths. A constellation of sensations spread across both our skins. When we touch, even our words fuck. Leon's fingers twitched against the ribbon, pulling it tight. The memory of Ben's hands on the back of his neck, stretching away a day's tension. Those hands tearing buttons, carefully stitched into place, with a grin and a promise to fix them later. I remember the way you cut every one of those words into my flesh. I feel the nib of your pen traveling with exquisite slowness up my leg. Do you remember the night you started a tail on my heel? You worked your way up my calloused sole, up my calf, circling my thigh. It hurt more exquisitely than any other story you ever wrote on me. It was our last night together, and you took your time. Any time I was close to coming, and I was close so many times, you stopped. Leon's body jerked. Pins scattered from a work table. Bobbins clattered to the floor. Thread of a dozen colors unwound, like nerves unstrung, and made new patterns as the spools rolled every which way. Ben's fingers nodded through his, pressing him back across the table. His legs hooked around Ben's waist, drawing him close. You wiped blood and ink from my skin and licked it clean from your fingertips. You made me wait. And when the trembling stopped, you set your pen against my skin again. You circled my leg, slow, so slow. You worked your way around my ankle, up my calf, binding my knee, covering my thigh. And you spoke, murmuring low, telling your tale so softly I couldn't quite hear, but I could feel it. Your voice a vibration, sounding in my bones, matching the movement of your pen. Every word, every letter, each stroke. Ben's finger sliding into his ass. Leon's breath catching hard, his lip bitten. And when he could scarcely stand it, when he was ready to come, Ben pulling out and looking down at him, smiling, eyes shining with mischief and love, making him wait. From nowhere... Ben produced a picnic, rich black bread slathered with butter, and a bottle of good red wine. Ben tearing chunks of bread from the loaf and placing them between Leon's lips. His other hand stroking Leon's cock, bringing him to the edge again and again and stopping, always making him wait. The bottle passed back and forth between them, their lips and tongues trading the taste of wine over and over again. Who can say how much blood I lost? But I lost it willingly and would lose it again. I know you would, too. And at the end, at the very end, when you circled my thigh, carving your words deep into my skin, following the curve of my hip bone, you put your mouth around my cock. You drew me in, writing without looking at your words. As much as I felt your tongue and lips caressing my shaft, teasing my head before taking me in again, It was your words I felt more. And I remember how you made me come. And finally, Ben's cock inside him. Leon's eyes rolling back in his head. After so long, hovering on the edge of coming, the fucking seemed to go on and on. The pleasure building in waves layered one atop the other. And when his orgasm arrived, it too seemed to go on and on. Now all that remains are the scars. My body is a book. When I close my eyes, pass my hands over the hungry ridges of flesh, it's your scars I feel. The book of you, written by my hand. Do you feel me? Outlining each word with my fingertips, making you shiver? You bite your lip for silence, to keep from flying apart. Your back arches. You tremble with the need to let go. But not yet. Your hands are on my skin, and I'm trembling too. If we can stretch this moment into infinity, all her fiercenesses metal soldiers and all his wickednesses terrible bombs won't matter. Instead of mud and rain, I'll feel the heat of your skin against mine. All the mouths of our scars will lock together, and no amount of distance will keep us apart. I'll find you, I swear. 
in the space where flesh touches flesh, where words bind us and run electric over our bodies, I'll find you. I'll find you. Leon's fingers stilled on the ribbon, his breath harsh. He opened his eyes, the ghost image of letters blurred by unshed tears. His cock was stiff again. He swallowed, throat tight with pain, and rubbed a hand over the ache straining in his trousers. It felt cheap. This was more than desire. The soldier and the attic woman writing to each other across such distances. They understood words the way he understood typewriters. The way Ben understood thread. Fingers on keys, pen on skin, ink and sweat and cum and blood. There was something sacred in it. He couldn't defile it. More than that, memory ached behind the swell of blood in his cock. His ghost filled him. Hands that could thread a needle with eyes closed. A tenor voice threading the space of their apartment, singing along to the records placed on a phonograph that spit and hissed. Music drifting down the stairs. Light footsteps. A shuffle dance. And then those same footsteps descending to their shared workspace. Two quick strides and Leon crossed the room, bunched the curtain in his fist, and tore it down. Dust swirled, making him cough. All of Ben's things, his needles, his cloth, his ghost filling every corner of the room. Ben's quick hands at the back of his neck, kneading away the tension as he bent over a typewriter, coaxing its delicate inner workings back to life. The taste of wine and rich black bread smeared thick with butter. Then broken glass. Then fire and his wickedness's army running through the streets, burning everything in its wake. A sob tightened Leon's chest, but did not break. It stayed inside, squeezing his heart, his lungs, making it hard to breathe. He unwound the soldier's ribbon, letting it pool beside the ribbon from the attic woman's typewriter. So much sorrow in the world. How could any one person be expected to bear up under it? Leon's fingers shook, but the stiff joints cooperated enough to let him undo the buttons of his shirt one by one. He stripped. Undershirt, trousers, shorts, everything. The clothes piled on the floor like fallen leaves and shed skin. His erection remained, but he didn't touch himself. He picked up the typewriter ribbon, unspooled on the table between the two machines. It didn't matter which it was. They were a continuation of each other. One story spread across the distance, yearning to be whole. A man and a woman. Human, yes, but also tales made flesh. Eternal stories that could not degrade and die the way humans could. His hands moved of their own accord. Leon wound the ribbon around his neck, not tight, but close enough to press the words against his flesh. Memory in ink shivered against his skin. He wound the ribbon around his chest, his belly, his legs. People could die. They could leave you behind, but stories... He would make himself a book, a haven for the soldier and the attic woman. He would be their bridge, a space for their story to go on and on. When one ribbon ended, Leon caught up the other. Tears rolled down his cheeks. His thin chest hitched, but he smiled. He pulled the ribbons tighter, weaving them over and under each other. It wasn't blood, he wouldn't scar, but the words would become part of him nonetheless. They sank into his bones making them light and hollow and bright. The woman, the man, their hands moved over each other, palms singing with words cut deep. The electricity of their touch sparked from bone to bone. With lightning, he stitched them whole. And he would be a book for Ben, too. Not ink or blood, but breath and memory. Every heartbeat would be a word in Ben's honor. He wouldn't hide from Ben's ghost. He would pull Ben into his arms every night, lie in their bed together, and dream enough for both of them. The taste of bread from Ben's fingers, his lips touched to Ben's throat, the muscles working so he felt the song beneath the skin, even in silence. All their history together, not written in words, but on his soul. His fingers reached the end of the ribbon, binding them, keeping them safe and together and whole. All of them, Leon, Ben, the attic woman, and the soldier. Leon closed his eyes. A sob, a sound of pleasure, a name on his tongue, spoken aloud after years of silence. 
it let him come, and it went on and on and on. <sighs> and there you have it. Was it good for you? Tell me what you think by calling the voicemail line, sending me an email, or finding me on Twitter. All those ways to contact me are over on the podcast website at nobilis.libsyn.com. And yes, we have a coupon code this week. Use FLESHWORD, F-L-E-S-H-W-O-R-D, when you buy the Flesh Made Word on the Circlet Press website to get 50% off. Hey, we did it. Two Circlet stories in one month. That is, if I get this posted in April. Otherwise, it'll be early May and we'll get, a, <laughs> get a, we'll get caught up again. I know this has seemed like the Circlet Press podcast lately, between the sponsored stories and Capricious, but I'm actively looking for more patron-funded stories to bring in. I know they're out there. Um, I'm not doing an open call for submissions yet because I, I just don't have time to read Slush. There are some fabulous authors out there. There's lots of stories that have never been given to audio. I'm sure I can find more good stuff. I just need to coax a few people to send me something. Speaking of May, if you're coming to Balticon, please do say hi. Um, I'll be all over the place all the time. I'm usually easy to find. And uh, I'd really love to meet you if you come to Balticon. So, you've been listening to the Nobilis Erotica podcast. Theme and incidental music is from Digital Juice. This podcast is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Until next time, listen hard.